Hello, Dr. Edelman here. I'm really excited to have a good friend and colleague today, Dr. Jenny Luna, who's a patient-oriented uh, endocrinologist who has an interest in weight management. And she's going to take us through a lot of new information about controlling weight and some new data that just came out in the medical field. And I'm going to jump in here and there, but it, I'm going to let Jenny uh, take it from here. Well, thank you, Steve. And it is my pleasure to be here today to definitely discuss one of my favorite topics. And uh, today we're going to talk about diabetes drugs that are tipping the scales for weight loss. All right. So the intentions for our talk today is to get into the science on weight and what are some of the medications that are available that can help. So Steve, you will agree that weight loss is extremely frustrating, right, for many of our patients. And um, it's important for us as providers and for patients to understand that weight gain or a high body mass index or BMI is not due to laziness or lack of willpower. And the reason is, is that there are many factors that are influencing our weight. Um, biological, and we're gonna get into all of these um, shortly, but biological factors like genetics, um, hormonal changes that happen in the body when we lose weight, and meta metabolic adaptation as well. Yeah, Jenny, let me just add that, you know, it is frustrating for patients. They've tried everything in the book. Absolutely. It's also frustrating for caregivers mm -hmm. because we, didn't ha we don't have great tools. Right. And, and I hear people complain, my doctor never talks about weight other than saying you need to lose it. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the data that just came out that Jenny mentioned, we're gonna talk about that at the end. Mm -hmm. Amazing yeah. information. And I really think it's gonna change the way we approach patients that have weight problems. And you're right, yeah. they get called uh, lazy, but it's such a genetic issue. Right, right, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to understand because then only if we understand it can we address it appropriately. So um, genetics, we can choose our family, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and 97, uh, there are 97 different regions of the human genome that are directly associated with increased body mass index. So if mom or dad is struggling with weight, then that puts us at risk um, to have the same struggles as well. It's, it's always our parents' fault. So yeah, it is, that's it. It's just mom and dad. <laughs> And it's no surprise that as we get older, it's much more difficult to lose weight. So why? And as you can see here on this curve, after the age of 20, it's so much easier to gain weight. Our metabolic rate decreases or the ability for us to actually burn calories decreases with time. And women, as uh, you can see, we are always ahead of the game, uh, even in this scenario here, where it's, it's uh, harder for, for us females to lose weight when tackling um, this issue. And then you add on <clears throat> menopause. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I don't think there's a woman on this earth that doesn't have problems maintaining her weight Right, once they right. reach menopause. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is uh, definitely a, a huge challenge um, for us women where after menopause, it's so much more difficult um, to lose weight and to keep it off as well. Perfect. So one of my um, kind of very, very uh, favorite topics too is um, the microbiome. Um, we are now aware that our gut flora or the microbiome is actually even labeled as our second brain. We have more bacterial cells than human cells and they all live pretty much in our intestine. And they play a very important role in our health and also our weight. And the food that we eat actually has a huge influence on the bacteria that's growing in the gut. So depending on the population of these uh, bacteria, there could be bacteria that can promote weight gain versus some can help, um, cause weight loss. So it's a very interesting um, topic, which, you know, again, putting another factor that will make it difficult for, for patients to lose weight. You know, Jenny, when I, when I read the slide, I, said, mm -hmm. I, I thought of the phrase, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And that, you know, <laughs> it's our second brain. Yes. But the, 
Well, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the other question I had for you, mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned that earlier before we started, was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the probiotic is a big market. Mm -hmm. They're yes, all over yes, the counter. Yes, yeah. They're really quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it. I got these gummy, probiotic gummies. Mm -hmm. There's two billion strains in every gummy bear. Then they sell Activa yogurt. Right, right. But, but what's your response to that? So uh, the problem with many of the probiotics is that we're not 100% sure that what's in those pills is exactly what's being sold. So the best way to do that is to introduce uh, foods that can actually lead to your own um, bacteria to grow or the, the good microbiome. And that's pretty much all your, your plant foods or foods high in fiber. So that's your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains. These are um, foods that are high in fiber and actually the bacteria of the gut um, feed off of this, um, release short chain fatty acids, which have anti-inflammatory properties. So again, you're kind of working with your body, giving it what it needs to replicate on its own. I, mean, I love that. Mm -hmm. you, you called it prebiotics. Right, right. Yeah, just pick the right foods. Exactly, exactly. Cool. Yeah, so and lifestyle, of course. Um, with this past year and uh, being in quarantine, I think we can all agree how um, easy it is to gain weight um, when we're stuck at home and you know we weren't walking, let's say, to work or walking to our vehicles. All of those steps count. Um, so the lack of physical activity definitely contributes to weight gain. Uh, important too is the food that we eat. So foods that are very palatable, like highly processed foods, um, high in sugar, fat, um, carbs. These foods tend to trigger a, a space in our brain that's called the reward circuit that's driven by dopamine. So that's the kind of like a loop that when we get stressed, then we think about these foods. We want to eat these foods to kind of feed the same circuit. Um, it's a uh, for instance, when we're having a bad day and you look at that chocolate cake and it's all of a sudden winking at you because it <laughs> looks like it is. <laughs> so again, that reward circuit makes it very difficult sometimes to, to lose weight. And of course, stress and sleep, um, when we deprive ourselves from sleep or we're not really checking in with ourselves to see what's going on with our stress levels, we release hormones such as cortisol that cause weight gain. So very important things to, to kind of keep in mind uh, in our process of weight loss. And say a few words about exercise because mm -hmm. we, you know, when you have weight problems, it's tougher to exercise. Yes, and yes. Uh, what, what kind of recommendations do you recommend for someone who's heavy and hard to get up and, and go sprint around the block? Right, know? right. And that, that's a great question. So there's something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or in short, it's called NEAT. So these are all the different activities that we do on a daily basis that doesn't include exercise. And this is what I usually tell patients, you know, instead of um, taking the elevator, maybe take the stairs, um, going for a walk with your pet or with your spouse or loved one, um, you know, parking the car further, the pool, walking in the pool, all these things that might not be classified as exercise, but do increase the uh, kind of caloric burn um, throughout the day as well. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Every little bit counts for Absolutely, sure. Absolutely, yes. Excellent. So, Steve, this is actually one of my favorite um, articles that was published in 2016, and we were talking about it earlier, which is um, quite fascinating. I'm not sure if everyone's aware about um, the show that aired several years back, uh, very, very popular, and it was called The Biggest Loser. So the core of, of this uh, show was basically to um, have uh, contestants that were struggling with weight, and they would put them on uh, very strict exercise routines and diet, and they lost 100 or 150 pounds, and whoever lost the most weight would win the contest. So. 16 of the contestants from The Biggest Loser were actually followed in time by scientists to see what actually happens to their metabolism and um, to their satiety hormones. And they actually noticed that after the show, they gained the weight back, but they had permanent damage to their metabolism. So they never readapted um, to their weight gain, which it shows us that slow and steady will get you to the end. 
So this is where we recommend to our patients. You know, you want to lose one to two pounds um, per week and not do those crash diets, which could end up harming us um, instead of actually causing more good. One to two pounds a week is a lot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always, any patient that I have that went on one of these weight loss mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. the faster they lose it, the faster they gain it back. Right, right, right. So it has to come with long-term changes. And that's also true when we're going to talk about some of these newer medications. Right, absolutely. And it's more of a lifestyle change and more of adapting to a new way of living. Excellent. And um, with diet, of course, and crash diets, there's a rise of this hormone called ghrelin. So kind of a funny character. We did a small animation here to show that. He's um, basically released from our stomach, goes to the brain, tells the brain, hey, I'm hungry. And uh, when we're trying to crash diet, then this hunger hormone goes up, making it very, very difficult um, to, to maintain to those strict caloric uh, uh, restrictions. You know, one of these days they're going to come up with an anti-gruelin pill. <laughs> but, but I've heard I've heard this hormone mentioned at right. major scientific meetings. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's it's when people who have weight problems have higher levels. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. So um, like sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass, um, research actually shows that they have less uh, levels of ghrelin because the stomach is um, pretty much modified in a way that decreases the amount of this hormone in the bloodstream. So very, very interesting stuff. Okay, so the hormone or the kind of the core of this um, uh, talk is this hormone called GLP-1 which we naturally make. Um, it comes from our intestine and it has multiple functions in our body from going to the brain and telling the brain, hey, we're full, to uh, going to the stomach and decreasing gastric emptying, to increasing insulin secretion, making our body more insulin sensitive, definitely has cardio protection and cardiovascular benefits, which we'll get into that shortly. So a very, very important hormone. And as we see here on this little animation, you know, this little hormone goes again to the brain, travels up there, and pretty much just gives the message that we have enough um, storage, enough energy in our body, um, and that we could pretty much stop eating at that point. Yeah, it's, it's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. Satiety right. versus appetite. Mm -hmm. So ghrelin affects appetite. Right. And I, I tell my patients on these medications that, you know, you, you might be just as hungry when you start a meal, right. but you're going to be full faster. Exactly. And people lose weight. Yeah, with smaller portions, which then by default decreases the caloric intake for that day. Good. So that brings us into the medications that can help. So we, uh, there are GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, that uh, there are several different types of these medications available for us to treat our patients with diabetes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, because they decrease the sugar production in the body, um, makes us more insulin sensitive, they are very potent for lowering the A1C. Um, they help with weight loss because of the gastric emptying is decreased. There's also now increased satiety, as you had mentioned earlier as well. It doesn't cause hypoglycemia. However, when paired with insulin, um, we often have to cut down on the insulin, which is always good. And research has continuously shown us how it protects against heart attacks and also stroke. Yeah, and <clears throat> I know you know this, Jenny, but uh, the American Diabetes Association puts out these treatment algorithms mm -hmm. for doctors. And usually the first medication is metformin. Most of you are probably on metformin. And if there's any evidence uh, of what we call ASCVD, atherosclerotic mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease, <laughs> <laughs> or you've had a heart attack or stroke or you have peripheral vascular disease, they recommend this class right. of drugs immediately yes. after metformin. Mm -hmm. Then you got to fight the insurance company. That's a whole different story. Yeah, that's a, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and the other thing too is that um, the very first one ha was put out in 2005. Mm -hmm. So these drugs have withstood the test of time yeah. and they were once a day, uh, twice a day injectable, mm -hmm. then it was 
nyctosas once a day, and yeah. now we have several once weekly. Mm -hmm. And even an oral medication, that medication called Rebelsis, God knows where they get these names from. I know. <laughs> uh, that's a pill that you take once a day, mm -hmm. and they all are GLP-1 receptor agonists. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, and as you can see, there are so many different types of, of these medications now available, which has really changed um, the management of diabetes. It's so rewarding when you're, you put patients on these medications and they lose weight, they're able to cut down their insulin. So it's good for the patients and it's good for the providers too, because we feel like, wow, we're actually yeah. kind of helping two avenues um, with one. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say one of the most common case scenarios that it helps is just like you said, mm -hmm. you have someone with type two diabetes on tons of insulin. Right. Every time you go yes. up on the dose trying to get the blood sugars down, nothing really changes except the mm -hmm, weight. Mm -hmm. And the weight goes up with a higher dose of insulin. And right. adding one of these things, uh, one of these medications on is, right. is impressive. Yeah. And so once again, they, they are extremely safe. We can talk about their side mm -hmm. effects later. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Victoza is a daily injection. Rebelsis, as Steve mentioned, is uh, an oral medication. You take it daily. And then Ozempic uh, by during intralicity are once a week. Excellent. So because of the positive effects that it has on weight, um, we, uh, we've seen that at higher doses, um, there's more significant weight loss. Uh, Trulicity uh, now has available higher doses. Initially, it started with 0 0.75, then the 1.5, and now we have available the 3 milligram and uh, the 4.5 milligram. And as we can see, I believe the baseline weight uh, for, for this study was two, a pound of 200. Uh, uh, and the weight loss for the 4.5 milligrams is about 10 pounds on average. So. Yeah, and 10 pounds will, t will go a long oh, way yes. for mm -hmm. your blood pressure, your cholesterol. Right. You're feeling better. And that's mm -hmm. average. Some people right. lose more. Yes. And you know, the, the main side effect to all these drugs is mm -hmm. nausea. Mm -hmm. And we know that if you... Uh, start low and go slow. Mm -hmm. uh, you can your your GI tract will adapt and the right. nausea will go away. And I think it's the rare person mm -hmm. who is so nauseated mm -hmm. they cannot take it at all. Right. What's right. your experience there? I sometimes also yeah definitely slow and steady. Um, you know they say about four weeks, but sometimes I'll stay with the lower dose for much longer, mm -hmm. just to make sure they're fine and then move on to the next step if needed. So yes, and on, this is on average. I mean, there are patients that lose much more as well, especially when they're pairing it with lifestyle changes. That's key. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, when you start losing weight, you feel better mm -hmm. about everything, yourself, right. your mm -hmm. joints, and you end up, I, I call that the reverse 22, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that people, they don't get worse, they get better. Right, right. Yeah, and losing um, five to 10% of your body weight decreases your blood pressure, increases HDL, which is a good cholesterol, drops your triglycerides. So, you know, I, it's even losing five, 10 pounds makes a huge um, change in the body and our health. So it's really good. And uh, Sixenda, which like Victoza, is a daily injection, but at a much higher uh, dose. Um, so this goes up to three milligrams. And again, we start slow and slowly increase the dose as well. And in this study, um, the average weight loss was about 21 pounds. As we can see, compared to placebo, uh, patients with the placebo group, when they did diet and exercise, lost about 3.5% of their body weight versus lifestyle, uh, diet, and physical activity plus Xenda. Patients had a 9.2% loss of weight. Yeah, and I, I, I'll just say one phrase about this mm -hmm. whole FDA regulation. Mm -hmm. Saxenda is the same as Victoza, right. just higher doses, mm -hmm. but because uh, the FDA said the primary indication is for people who are quite heavy, then you need to call it a different name. Mm -hmm. right, so right. it is confusing. So mm -hmm. Victoza is basically Saxenda, and we have one more example to talk about that too. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So this is actually the new kid of the block, uh, Wegovi. Um, like um, Ozempic, um, it's a but much more higher dose. Um, you know, with patients that uh, were started 
you, sim similar to Ozempic, we start at a lower dose at the 0 0.25 and then slowly increase to the max dose, which is 2.4 milligrams once a week. Um, very, very significant uh, weight loss, uh, of four, about 14.9% when compared to the placebo group, which only did diet and um, physical activity, only lost 2.4%. So in summary, basically, if someone weighs 200 pounds before they start with Gobi, on average, they would lose about 30 pounds in five months, which is very, very good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Now, the FDA considers 5% yeah. body weight loss Right. appropriate to be mm -hmm. classified as a weight loss drug. Right. So this is 15%. Yes. And the other thing too is if you notice um, in the small print, mm -hmm. it takes five months right. to titrate to the highest dose. Exactly. For those of you on Ozembic, it's one milligram mm -hmm. of Wegovi. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you say about trying to get this drug? What, any tips or uh, tricks? Uh, yeah. I've heard that um, the folks at Novo Nordis are going to do their best to try to make it as accessible mm -hmm. as possible. So you have to get your doctor on your side and they have right. to fill out a, what we call a prior authorization, mm -hmm. which we hate. Yeah, so, <laughs> but we'll, like do, the, but we we'll do it for you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, the medication started uh, was released in June, and um, it it's a process. But I mean, with this significant weight loss, I, I feel like with time it will be much easier. Um, we have patients that do the sleeve gastrectomy and lose thirty pounds. So here we have a medication where they don't have to go under the knife and you know go for surgery. Um, and there's data showing its safety, cardiovascular uh, protection, because we have that with Ozempic. So I think with time, it, you know, we hope that it will be much easier. Yeah, the other thing that these insurance companies really need to know is that you're not just reducing someone's weight. Right. You got yeah. the heart disease, but yeah. also um, gastro gastrointestinal reflux disease, mm -hmm. and even more importantly than that, sleep apnea mm -hmm. and fatty liver. Right. Right. So there's a thing called fatty liver disease that mm -hmm. can end up leading to cirrhosis. Yes, yes. Um, and right now the best treatment for fatty liver, which occurs in people with type 2, mm -hmm. is weight loss. Mm -hmm. There's no fancy way to treat it. So right. the cost savings are tremendous and lifestyle right. uh, and your quality of life is invaluable. Right, exactly. And the, the body is like a machine of balance. Um, when the body starts to lose weight, it starts to lose weight internally. So the visceral fat or the fat around the organs like the liver and the heart, the body taps into that first. And unfortunately, patients don't see that on the scale and they'll say, oh, I haven't lost any weight. But I tell them, do your pants feel looser? And they're like, yeah, absolutely, it does. And again, this is the body trying to balance things out for us. You know, I never knew that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, explain what the fat around the organs is, because I think that's visceral fat is something that's a doc, more of a doctor right, topic. Right, right, right. So it's the, when we gain weight, everyone's built differently. And um, there are some people, let's say, that might gain more weight in the abdominal area. Some might gain more weight, let's say, um, in uh, the lower uh, uh Kind of the lower end of the body like the thighs so with visceral fat um, basically now the body starts to accumulate fat around the organs so that's the heart and the liver and also sometimes around the muscle so that's uh, at the core of type 2 diabetes which you know if we have mom or dad that has type 2 diabetes and you know that also puts us at risk as well um, and that visceral fat is very inflammatory. So the largest, the largest endocrine organ is actually fat. It's very much alive and it releases inflammation that um, causes problems, you know, to the heart, uh, insulin resistance. So as soon as the body sees itself in the opportunity to be able to lose weight, then it starts to consume that, air, um, that fat for energy because of the caloric deficit. So it starts to use that fat as, as a source of energy. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you may not notice it. Right, right, exactly, yes. And then if you exercise, I know mm -hmm. muscle weighs two and a half times of fat. Right. So if you start building muscle, mm -hmm. you're not gonna, the scale may not drop, but you're probably gonna feel better. Right, right. And fit into yeah. your clothes better, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a complicated topic, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know obesity was the biggest organ. 
Uh, fat, yeah. Is fat. Biggest, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Use yeah. that word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fat is, is the largest endocrine organ. Yeah. It's quite fascinating. And just all um, the hormones actually come from this, um, this entity. So excellent. So take home messages like we, you know, pretty much hammered it multiple times is initially to address your lifestyle. You know, these factors we talked about, stress management, sleep and physical activity, um, food, Uh, And GLP-1 receptor agonists have demonstrated cardiovascular disease benefit. They help lower glucose, but they also cause weight loss. And now at the higher doses of the GLP-1 agonists, um, we see significant weight loss when paired with lifestyle changes. Well, gosh, you know, uh, lecture by Dr. Luna today (laughs) is is, uh, starting off our our weight management section on our video vault, Mm -hmm. along with lectures from really good dietitians that Mm -hmm. that get it. So thank you you so much for uh, coming on and sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. (laughs) Now I can exhale as soon as we stop uh, fully.